Awesome. Um, thank you so much for having us. I'm excited for this conversation today. Uh, Tina, let's start with an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your areas of interest? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Tina. I'm currently the head of design at Element Finance, um, which is a fixed and variable market protocol. Um, previously, um, I did some work within the wallet space, um, and prior to that, I was in Web2 um, and big tech, and I'm super excited to be here because I've been an advocate of kind of making this space more accessible to a lot of people from diverse backgrounds, so. Yeah, excited to dive into it. Uh, quickly, my background, my name's Mansi. Um, I've worked uh, on decentralized data storage protocols for the last three and a half years, thought a lot about user ownership, not just from money as a perspective, but also data, social graph. Um, and I also founded Women in Blockchain, which is a nonprofit uh, building diversity in the crypto space and uh, launched an investment DAO called Komarevi that funds and invests in female founders in the space. So I've been thinking a lot about how do we build crypto ecosystems with diversity at its core. And so today our topic uh, of discussion is how do we design for diversity? And how do we build applications, build protocols, build uh, this technology for everyone? And if we want real global adoption, we need to start thinking and having these conversations uh, sooner than later. So with that, um, Tina, would love to hear from you, you know, what does designing for diversity mean to you and why is it important? Yeah, so I think um, there's a lot of different avenues that could it, it kind of be broken down into, um, but my favorite um, way to kind of look at it is there's designing for diversity within your team and your protocol and how you're hiring that team, how you're um, retaining them as members of your team and how they are actually um, implementing um, diverse design and product practices within your protocol. And then there's also um, how you're designing your protocol and the usage of your protocol to be accessible and um, accessible to people of all diverse backgrounds. So I think this is a very high level um, concept uh, that's oftentimes um, you guys hear buzzwords and people not really breaking it down on a granular level, but what it kind of means to me in my day to day is um, how do you educate a user to better understand and be onboarded within the space for using DeFi? So at a fixed and variable rate protocol, what that kind of looks like is if I'm building a fixed rate borrow module, which a lot of people in this audience may not know, is a leveraging feature for a DeFi protocol. And leveraging feature means that you are taking out um, collateral against a fixed rate or variable market rate position for yield or interest and explaining that to a retail user so that they can better be, um, so we can better on-ramp um, retail adoption to the DeFi space. What that looks like is right now, DeFi protocols don't really break that down of what, what that means. What is that user getting when they're going into that future position? And how that can be broken down on a product or UI perspective is instead of having all of that information displayed to them, obfuscating that and kind of simplifying it in a way that they only see a risk style and they get to select a numeric value of the risk that they want to um, have when they're en entering a position on your DeFi protocol and then a balance. So they get to use this dial of, oh, how much risk do I want to have when I'm entering this position on your protocol? And this risk is then analyzed and optimized by their balance that they have deposited on the protocol. And that's a really, really simple way that they can then visualize and understand this position that I'm going into. It has this risk profile. And um, another thing when you're bringing this down and on the way is educating them about all the different steps that they're taking while completing this transaction, but kind of simplifying it so that they see 
okay, this is what this position is, this is kind of what the benefit as a user I get, and I think that's gonna be a huge way that we get more diverse backgrounds um, utilizing these structured products, because what made me passionate about DeFi and um, design experiences in DeFi is that oftentimes these structured products, they were only accessible to people within traditional finance and institutions. So obviously we do want institutions so that we're not in a bear market <laughs> constantly. Um, and we do want them to deploy capital within our space, but we also do want to give retail users and people that were often not given um, the opportunity to access these structured products um, and have the same opportunities as institutions or people within traditional finance. So that's kind of what um, designing diverse products looks for me on a day-to-day -day level. I love that. So what I'm hearing is two components. One, you could think of it from a product perspective. How are you building these products to actually serve the population that you want to serve? And this population doesn't look the same. Um, and, and when we talk about diversity, it's not just gender diversity, there's the racial diversity, there's diversity of age, there's diversity of experience, access, knowledge, background. Um, and so that's one component. How do you build, the, you can only build these products when you have the people that you want to, uh, you want to build for, right? So these people will bring the perspective, they would bring the, their level of understanding to the design process in itself. If the room looks the same and the product that they're building looks the same, then they're building it for a certain segment of the population. Um, I want to dive into both these segments, um, but uh, before that, I think like, you know, from your experience building element, would love to hear what is your process end to end look like when you're designing or thinking of a feature particularly, and how do you go about it? Yeah, so um, on a smart contract level, I work with our head of smart contracts and kind of break down on a functionality level um, what the smart contract functionality of um, the smart contracts that they're building um, for our protocol and how they can be translated in our product and what the benefit to the user would be. And then I work with our product researcher and product manager to kind of break them down on a user flow basis and a product uh, market positioning basis and see like, okay, what is the benefit to the user? So what can they benefit from um, utilizing this function? Do we obfuscate it? Do we make it simplified or kind of don't show them in any way? Um, a huge um, example of this is in our V2, um, we are actually, um, most of the positions that we're presenting, they're a mix of variable rate positions. And if you're a um, recurring LP in this space, a lot of LP positions are actually variable rate positions in DeFi. So how we kind of simplify that information on a smart contract level all the way to the product perspective is that we're just not telling them that they're LPing on their protocol for V2. They're just going to see it as a variable rate product all across the protocol. And that's an easy way that you can kind of translate that um, that LP positions, they're um, now fungible standards that have these umbrella terms that are uh, four month terms that are then fungibly passed on with an auto rollover smart contract permit. And the users, they understand, um, okay, this is a variable rate LP position, but they don't have to understand that auto rollover feature um, and that smart contract functionality. So simplifying it in a way that they can kind of see um, the information that, that would benefit them and benefit, oh, this is why I want to utilize this feature on the protocol um, without presenting too much information. Because I think one thing we do really poorly um, in the space is that we are all brilliant and intelligent people, but we oftentimes try to prove how our protocols and products are so intelligent to other people. <laughs> and oftentimes that doesn't help us onboard retail or um, newer users that need to be educated and need um, a lot of the products, especially structured products within DeFi to be broken down and simplified, so. I love that, I love that. Um, there is also this nuance between educating via your product and protocol and then using other sources of education, like building tutorials, explaining, having ELI work five, like, like really simple explanations of your, work, work of your product. Um, and I think, you know, before, as we were discussing what we want to chat about today, you had mentioned there's this 
the product life cycle conversation of like, how do you build inclusive products? But then there's the false product conversation. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, one thing I really um, am ex excited about is um, after our post-product launch for V2, we're also launching an educational walkthrough of our um, product and uh, the, the product that you users will be utilizing. And what I mean by that is um, if anyone in the audience has utilized Drift Protocol, um, the Perpetuals Exchange, um, they do a really good job of walking users through each aspect of the protocol and teaching them about each feature and function on the protocol. And that's one thing that I think a lot of DeFi protocols um, should be doing more um, because they do endure um, a certain amount of risk when they are utilizing your protocol and teaching them about this and teaching them about how can they can make the best decisions and they can learn about what they're doing um, when utilizing the protocol will help us onboard um, more users into this space and help them feel more pro empowered um, when making financial transactions. Um, so that's something I'm really passionate about and also educational resources. So breaking down um, the product and the different features of the product um, with educational resources past white papers. Because I think one thing our space does really well is we have really great experimental research documents on a high level that we release for our protocols. And then after it's shipped, we're just like, okay, we're gonna release it into the wild. No, yeah. no expanded but research. If you wanna understand our project, read the white paper. Exactly, <laughs> read the white paper. That's high level. We don't need to be on a grassroots level. So really releasing grassroots level documentation and research to break down how the protocol works, um, how different uh, functions of the protocol work and what the user is doing, what the flow of the user um, would potentially be and how they can break down the protocol usage. So um, that's a really great way to engage users um, after post product, product launch. Yeah, and I think one thing that's important is being intentional when you're building these products, when you're building these documentations, educational material. Um, something I've seen in the industry is you build these products and then you're like, oh wait, how do we onboard more women using this product? Or how, how do we onboard more people of color, you know, or people from other countries to be using this product? I think that's like a flipped way of looking at it. You need to be building these products, keeping in mind what your end users should, you know, what end users you want to serve. And I think that should be a part of the process not at the end. And I think that's just generally for crypto as an industry, I think having these conversations early on is important, not like with the traditional finance industry where I come from, um, where it's mostly retrospective and looking behind. Um, I really want us to encourage and have these conversations early on. Um, with that, I wanna shift gears to like the hiring practices which you touched upon a little bit um, earlier. Yeah, can you tell again from your experiences how do you, yeah, how have you thought about hiring for diverse talent? Yeah, um, I was actually one of the first, I was the first female at Element. Now it's almost half um, POC or uh, female. So I'm really, really happy about that. And also my team is one POC and another woman. And um, yeah, it makes me really happy to promote di diverse pra practices. But I think one thing that I've been super passionate about and um, that I've been doing is that a lot of the times we hear this this notion of hire, diverse hiring practices, but how do you actually um, retain and reduce churn of those very people that you're recruiting? So one thing we do um, at Element is we have um, one-on-ones and kind of like a buddy that they're given um, from the moment they're hired. And then um, usually like my buddy, we still have one-on-ones six months later. So having someone that they're um, similar to, and if there's not someone that they're similar to, having someone that's external from the company that they can be paired with to kind of give them mentorship and onboard them from the pipeline of um, being newly hired and onboarded to growing within the company. And then after it's the process of um, growing within the company, helping them understand how can they get upward mobility. Because we see a lot of women and uh, POC and minorities and diverse people coming into the space, but a lot of the times they're within junior positions. So how do we move them and help them with upward 
mobility to become founders, to become within senior positions, and to really have a seat at the table where they can be making uh, major decisions for the protocol. So that's a huge aspect of reducing churn and mentorship. Um, another um, incredible way is like when I joined, um, our COO made um, <laughs> a sexual harassment and HR policies, and a lot of protocols do not have that. So making sure that um, you have uh, policies within place that protect your um, diverse hires so that they feel safe, there's practices that can protect them and they're put in policy and um, that that's done um, retroactively. So it's not something that's reactive to a situation that may occur within your protocol so or your company. So that's a really, really great way. And um, I think the last one is really um, past the um, policies and mentorship is making sure that they can experience, oh, whoa, I just noticed that there's someone that worked at my protocol prior upstairs um, that they can feel, <laughs> Sebastian, <laughs> you, I don't know if you can hear this, um, making sure that they can really feel welcome and that they're learning and they're growing within the company because that's how you grow the best people within the space. Um, and they'll feel invested in your protocol and company, and then they'll be making an incredible brand for your company. So I think a lot of founders and um, people don't see value in how they can help with that brand of mobility, but it benefits your protocol and helps the community in, in a lot of ways. So. Yeah, um, and I think you know it's it, it's an end to end process, right? Where you have um, inclusive hiring practices, but it's not it doesn't end there. Like you said, it's also about once you know you've onboarded the, these people to your protocol, to your project, to the industry in general. And this is something that we've thought a lot about with women in blockchain, where initially we were very heavily focused on education and onboarding more onboarding more pro people to the space. Uh, but what happens once they're in the space? How do you support their journey? How do you support their careers? How do you support them in leadership roles? And I think one thing we realized uh, as an industry, we don't have great support structures, one in leadership roles, but like for women in founding roles. And I think uh, that's where our motivation for Kumar AB started, where we are focused on funding female founders in the space, creating a community for these founders to learn from each other, to connect, to support each other. And so it's an end-to-end -end, you know, process or cycle. It doesn't, you know, doing one thing and just calling it a day doesn't work. You need to be intentional in the entire process. Um, with that, uh, you know, I think one question that comes up often is whose responsibility is it? to be thinking about diversity, to be thinking about inclusiveness, both in terms of products and the people in the space. W what's your response to that question? Yeah, so I have a, a lot of feelings about this question because the, the answer would be, oh, the people of the diverse backgrounds, right? Because they're advocating for themselves. But it's so funny because prior to this conversation, we were discussing outside how a lot of the people of diverse backgrounds in this space, you find out they're doing 10 things. They run four different clubs, five side projects, they're an organizer at an event, they somehow have their own startup, they are the head of a protocol, and also have time to ski in the Alps. So um, I think the notion that only di people of diverse backgrounds should be um, kind of missioning this, this um, ideology is not something um, that we should be doing no longer. Um, I think having a more inclusive co conversation and calling in the rest of the community is really something that we should be moving towards um, because we can't be having conversations of upward mobility or um, ha investing in female founders or supporting female founders or supporting protocols that are led by female founders or um, senior leadership with uh, females um, without um, those conversations. And oftentimes, um, I find it's um, on a high level and there's not really conversations about how it would strategically be implemented. So I think that's something I'd really love to see in the space about how we can move past maybe just starting a tweet thread of, oh, who's the woman in Web3 you like? <laughs> Into like a granular level of, okay, so you like this woman in Web3. Let's see how, how much do you want to drop for her, her angel check? 
how much do you want to um, invest in her protocol? Okay, so you don't want to do an angel check. How much? Um, what's a potential integration your protocol can do with her her protocol? Let's let's make it an action. I love that. I think you know there is there's a place for conversations like these, uh, but there's also a place for action and real action, real making real impact. And are you allocating time? Are you allocating resources? Are you allocating capital? And it's such a flywheel. It's a virtuous cycle in the sense that you know you fund more female founders in the space. They will end up hiring more female like leaders in the space. More female leaders hire more female um, in in uh, you know different roles within the space, and they will build diverse, inclusive products. So it's a cycle. I mean, we need to start somewhere and start making action beyond just, like you said, the tweet threads uh, of you know women in the space. And I think she's been in the industry for like five years. We've definitely made a lot of progress. Like 2017 in this room, maybe it would be like two women, and I'm seeing maybe like five, ten. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's progress, but it's not, you know, it's nowhere close to where we want to be. And the, we, we still have a lot to do in terms of building this technology for its real ethos and real purpose. And uh, hopefully this conversation is just a start. Um, any closing thoughts? No, no um, definitely would just say like, if you're a male founder or someone of a non-diverse background, I think the first, the first step to having um, this conversation is definitely um, just being like open and understanding and saying um, and kind of accepting that you may not know um, how to do this and that you're in this mission together. It's not an us versus them conversation. It's more so like, let's do this together. The protocol will be so much better and more kick ass if you do it together. So that's kind of the first step, but I'm super excited to see how this space hopefully evolves. Yeah, and there are so many organizations, shout out to some of them, like of course, Women in Blockchain, the SheFi Boys Club, G256, uh, Women Who Build Web3, just tons of organizations who are putting a lot of time, energy, and thinking behind this. So if you don't know where to get started, you can always reach out to them. Uh, with that, thank you so much, Tina. This was an incredible conversation. Thank and you. thank you so much for having us. Thank you, thank you.